theater guy for a long time uh, and toured the United States with some uh, very bad theater companies. <laughs> and then moved to New York where I, I, I um, started doing a lot more work in theater and kind of dedicated myself to theater. Um, at that point in time, I was working as an actor, as a dancer, and um, I also, on, on the side, did a lot of uh, stage work, uh, behind the stage work. Uh, a lot of design for dance companies, a lot of design for uh, theater companies. Um, I worked at the Little Rattle in New York. I worked at the big places. I worked at uh, my mama Rattle. <laughs> and I worked at, um, I ended up at the Metropolitan Opera being their sort of metals expert. You needed a sword. Sword, if you needed a breastplate, I made a breastplate. Uh, and I worked with a lot of really good uh, German metal workers at that time, and I, I picked up a lot of skill that way. When I was in college, I also um, took a seated job to uh, work in the shipyards, um, and I was taught welding and cutting in the shipyards. And I was taught the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it. And it was quite a thorough education, and I also found out why I didn't want to be a welder because. Small guys with well get put in very small places <laughs> with little rods and burn and burn all day long. It was not a very uh, not a very great place to be. Um, so in New York, um, all throughout this period that I was um, working as an actor and dancer, um, I kept focusing on my work, which was steel, and I kept doing um, things interesting things that was interesting that I would do, and then basically running around with a little trowel to. It was a little alarming to the people in the galleries because they're not used to having people actually trundle up and show their work to you. <laughs> it was a little scary for them. <laughs> but we, um, I, I kept doing this for a long time. And um, eventually, the techniques that I developed now in my work now came out of the theater work. Um, and, and came out of working with these incredibly skilled Germans who really knew sheet metal, knew how to move metal, knew how to, knew how to move the steel. Um, so at a certain point in time, I was living on a tugboat in the middle of uh, Manhattan. And I had a forge on the back of the tugboat, which was walking around. It was, it was quite interesting. And uh, I had the tugboat, of course, slope both ways, and I was making furniture, and of course, there was no place in that tugboat to find out that things were square. So I was taking things off under the dock, stepping across and putting them down and coming back and on to them. No, not right. We spent a lot of time doing that. And I met my wife on that tugboat. Um, she came across the, uh, the housing one day and, and uh, moved down the boat. And she was also from Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, from that time on, she was a dancer. And from that time on, we kind of worked together and um, sort of figured out that we were kind of done with New York. At that point in time, it was really hard to find studio space. Everybody was moving out in Manhattan. Uh, studio space was getting ridiculously expensive. And um, we just decided that we were going to see if we could actually make living as artists and move up the coast. And let's see what happened. At that point in time, I already had a, a, a little bit of a time in Portland, Maine, because I was the uh, actor's equity asking me to go to an open Portland stage company for them as their equity manager. Um, so at that point in time, I kind of knew about Portland, I kind of knew about Maine. Well, here's a way that I could actually work as an artist and not have to support myself with 1,100 other different jobs I did. One of which was, I don't know if anybody knows, but I used to be a wire walker. I used to be a circus performer. <laughs> and I used to do um, street work in New York. Uh, I actually worked with Philippe Petit, who was the French wire walker walked across the uh, World Trade Towers. And uh, we set up, I worked with him as his personal assistant for two years. And, so a few jobs, one of which was our last job, and together, and Maya was on it, and we went out to the Grand Canyon to put a wire across part of the Grand Canyon, which was a total disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work at all, but it was a really good experience, <laughs> and it, could have worked, it sort of made me really decide it was time to get out of the way. <laughs> and, uh, uh, let me just tell you about her. I work in steel um, almost exclusively. And um, it comes steel, my work in steel comes from uh, the fact that steel is malleable 
for me, it's inexpensive. It has infinite uh, possibilities of, of patination, of patina. Um, and it is an industrial metal. And industrial metals were really brought to the forefront by a very few people in the 1930s, probably Buda Gonzalez from the most famous. He was a contemporary of Picasso. And um, he um, was a blacksmith and a welder. And what he did was he took an industrial metal, which at that point in time could not even be shown in any art form whatsoever. Um, it was all bronze or stone or uh, marble in the sculpture. And uh, he took an industrial metal, he welded it, he did not apply patination, and he made forms and images. Uh, a lot of them were abstract. Picasso saw this, Picasso got it. Was, it segued into what he was also a very good friend of uh, Quinn's And it sort of segued into his work. And as some of the work that Picasso did early as a sculptor, a lot of people have never seen this stuff, but this is, a, this is actually work of Picasso's. And he did um, several. You know, this is all twisted steel. And this all comes right from Gonzalez. Gonzalez is, you know, this is, this is Gonzalez. <laughs> This is 1922, I think. Um, and he, uh, some of these are more famous than others. This is a very famous, uh, you can see. There is an image there, it is somewhat figurative. It's, it's a woman, it's the eyebrows. Um, you can see where Picasso got a lot of ideas. <laughs> And he was, I, I, I respect Gonzalez because he was really at the very beginning of taking an industrial metal and making it art. And so you had to look beyond the fact that it was not bronze. And this was alarming people at that point time. It was then picked up by a lot of other people. Cesar was another one, another good favorite of mine. Cesar was a very famous um, uh, Paris Parisian. He worked in metal. Again, you can see again it's all added in metal, just adding pieces to it, welding it on. And some of, some of it's figurative, some of it's not. And he later worked. He's probably most famous for his, he won the coat, the Palme d'Or for a statue of his thumb. <laughs> it was like, he was like, looking here, and it was like, and it was like 1935, I think. And it was, it was, 10 foot statue on his thumb. And he, he, he loved to do that kind of stuff. But again, he was taking steel. Again, this is, this is a beautiful piece of it. I'll have to post that later. He was taking steel, and he would then figure his sculpture with it. And he was welding it, he was hammering it, and he was brazing it. Um, these are all techniques that were foreign to most people. My work, um, my work is more, as you can see, this piece here, this is a figure piece. I do a lot of figure work um, because the images are important to me. This is hollow. It's basically the techniques I use are hammering, forging. Um, I do a technique that is actually a jewelry technique called repose, which is called basically the beating from the backside. I use a large hammer. With different size heads on it. I place the piece, so this piece here is a good example. This is like half of what I normally do. But I like this piece because it has that, it has that missing part. So, um, but I'll take a piece like this. This, this so there's a cut here and a cut here. But this is all formed under a hammer um, is one piece. And um, the hammer is, you know, I have an air driven hammer. I use a lot of different heads to do it. Basically, a custom uh, system. And I beat from the back side. So I'll have this face down on the hammer. And I'll use the desk for other hammers to form these different shapes that I want. I'm stretching, I'm cutting, I'm doing some minor welding when I need to. Belly buttons need to be welded. Other things need to be welded on. <laughs> Um, the images that I do 
in this manner? Well, and one of the things that goes back to my, to my history of, of being a, uh, working on stage things is that I always like to make my pieces so I can carry uh, The light, these things can only be taken off of so I this was about 30 pounds, I was about 5 pounds. Um, so I always had this ability to make large objects. Uh, I've done 16, 17, 18 foot pieces that, um, you know, weigh 70 pounds. Which is a big deal when you're thinking of bronze. If you think of bronze, something like that would be two pounds. And stone also is going to be very heavy, hard to move around, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, that's another thing. It gives you the flexibility um, in, in a sort of economical way to give large and light filters um, without having to deal with a lot of interior structure or a lot of. Uh, you know, when you're doing bronze, uh, cast a piece like this in bronze, and probably the casting fees would be somewhere around fifteen, twenty thousand dollars just to cast it. And you would have to make the uh, make the wax process, take it down, and have to cast it. Uh, all our work is done by me from start to finish. This is a sheet of steel, and it ends up exactly like it is. I've done everything on this. Nothing is nothing's been sent out. It is a method very close to, and I use a lot of techniques that come from the car industry, where people hand make cars, you know, like the old Ferraris or the Harris. Um, and those techniques are, are adaptable in this, car, this gauge of metal, which is a 16 gauge metal. This is actually heavier than you can use on a car. Um, but those techniques um, are very useful to me. Uh, English wheel, hammers, grinders, I mean, anything I can get to make the, to make the metal move. Although steel, steel is, a great, is, a, is a great medium because it can stretch, it can shrink, uh, I can heat it, I can move it. This fish is bronze, so when I lay this fish out, I use rods, metal rods, steel rods, and then I just braise over them. And because of the brazing adhere to the, to the base, so I can have both worlds here, I have the bronze on top of the steel. Um, makes it easier for me to do with my work. Um, now, basically, the images that I do, um, most of the figurative, I have to say, I do a lot of figurative work. Um, because, to me, the, the work that I do comes from, well, it basically comes from the images that I carry around in my head on a day to day basis. This piece here, um, I would say, it represents in a lot of different ways, how humans do not adapt well to living in their environment with the, with the animals and things around them. Um, and you wouldn't get that necessarily by looking at it, which is what I like to do. I like to have my pieces be complicated so that people look at them and not can't quite figure them out. Um, this piece, this is a woman torso. Now, I didn't, no head and no arms. Um, once you put a head on a figure, that because we're so orientated with our way our eyes are, the way we recognize people and see people, um, it, the head then steers the figure. It becomes about the head. It becomes about the face. Is she kind? Is she happy? Is she sad? That's what it becomes about. This is a representation of humanity as opposed to a distinct figure, a person. Okay. So the the fish is actually um, this was taken from a. Uh, this is a, a stone, uh, an old, uh, how do you say it? It was basically a fossil, a fossil fish. There you go. It was a fossil fish. And uh, I put that on there because I didn't want it to represent this time period. I wanted it to represent um, an ancient time period. And what I'm saying is that this is a very ancient fish, and somehow we haven't dealt with this correctly in this planet until we have this. this it's called tattoo. It's called tattoo because it is sort of a branding of the human species. That gets a little heavy. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> but that's what I do in my work is I try to put as much of the things that go on in my head into that work and then I put it out there. And it, it's sometimes complex, too complex for you and me to describe, but that's when I feel like I've actually succeeded. Is when it becomes too complex for me to describe. Um, 
and, and I, I sort of like that. And, uh, then I'll do similar things too. I mean, this is obviously simple, but there was a thought on the, in this piece here, because of the innocence of the obviously boy-like figure, I really wanted to put a bullet in there. And that, was, that was where I felt it was too innocent, it was too pure. But, but there wasn't enough statement here for me. Um, and I have put bullet holes in several of the pieces. Uh, and simply, I know it's not because I don't like them. <laughs> it's because there's another level there that I can put in that, that, that makes it even more complex. The figure on the stairway is probably my most complex uh, piece to date, and it really, to me, it's about, it's a cruciform figure, you have a cruciform figure. Is that, is that a statement on religion? Possibly. You have the figure possibly being dead. You don't know. You have the crow sitting on there as though they were, as though the object was dead, the man was dead. We don't know for sure. Um, it, it's, a, it's a complex piece, and I, I think it's, it was the sort the pinnacle of this series that I was doing. I also did this series. I had ideas. The series go on for five or six pieces, and then they, and they kind of wander off. Um, I guess the last thing I can say is I do furniture because I think it's sneaky art. I like to sneak art. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions?